Hello everyone and welcome to Frock Talk, a monthly series where we examine the original Victorian garments that I have in my collection. Now it was my birthday a couple of weeks ago and my amazing friend Liz gave me three original Victorian bodices that had all come from the same family originally. So today we're going to be looking at one of those which is a late 1890s bodice worn by a young teen who was about 13 or 14 at the time. So I actually haven't taken a very close look at this bodice yet, so this is going to be my first time seeing all these details along with you guys, so I think this is going to be fun. So like I said, this bodice was one of three that all came from the same family. Two of them belonged to the same woman and one of them probably belonged to her mother. But this one is the one that she wore when she was about 13 or 14 and it is incredibly tiny. I tried putting it on my mannequin so I could show it to you in the way it would have been worn by a person, but it does not fit on my smallest mannequin. So this has a front waist measurement of 10 and a half, which would put it around 20 to 21 inches total waist measurement. And then the bust, it's gonna be between 28 and 30 inches in total. So the shape of this bodice is very typically late 1890s, early 1900s. It has your short waist with this very small point and it has this pigeon front, which is just a little bit of poofiness. It's not the huge pigeon fronts you see later on. And then it's pleated down with these absolutely minuscule little pleats to keep the poof mostly at the top here. So the main fabric of this is a very fine brown wool and then the center is made in silk that has these little embroidered dots on it. It's really pretty. And uh, even though this looks like a pretty simple plain bodice, it does have wonderful little details. The trim is really beautiful. Oh, there are even more moth holes back here. Holy moly. That's that's pretty sad. That's unfortunate, but the back is one very broad piece. There's no center back seam. And then we have two very small side back seams right here. So mostly it's one big piece of fabric, which is interesting. And then right at the center back, we have a big bow made out of that same brown polka dot silk. The sleeves are a very typical two piece shaped sleeve and it's gathered a bit at the top, mostly towards the back of the bodice, but it does have quite a bit of gathering to give it a bit of volume at the sleeve head. So the bodice opens on the side here and then up at the shoulder, which is, you start to see this, which you see this kind of opening configuration a lot in the 1890s. So the buttons themselves are actually a different fabric from anything else on this bodice, which makes me wonder if they didn't match the skirt. The skirt is now missing, but I wonder if this kind of orangey ribbed fabric was on the skirt somewhere. Let's take a look at the inside of this bodice. Okie dokie. So the inside, we have some interesting things happening here. The inside is lined with a polished cotton that is almost the same brown color as the outside of this dress. It's not quite the same, but it's pretty close. In the lining, there is a center back, which is interesting because there wasn't one on the outside. And then we ha it's been pinked to keep it from fraying, even though this fabric doesn't seem to want to fray that much in the first place, but it sure did it. So the side back seams have some sort of like crazy reinforcement going on here and the seam allowance is mega wide. I wonder if it was done that way to allow for growth, but I don't know, it doesn't look like they were ever redone. So, I don't know what, why this is like so strongly reinforced back here. And then the underarm seams are the same way. They've got that crazy reinforcement on there. There's this like twill, like a really wide twill tape that they've sewn down to the seam allowance. And it looks like this is all machine stitch. None of this is done by hand. The only hand stitching I'm seeing is actually down here where the hem was turned up. But we'll get to that in a minute. I'm really curious about what the purpose of this seam reinforcement is. 
because these are hefty. I mean, they're not thick, they're very flexible, and the tool tape is not thick, but I mean, why? This bodice is pretty heavily boned. There's on the under, the underarm seam, the side back seam, the side back. So it looks like every single seam on this bodice is boned, including the darts. So the lining has two darts on either side of the front. Wait, no, it has four darts. What? What's happening? Hold on, I gotta, I gotta look again. Okay, so I see now, okay. This is the center front. The lining closes on the center front with hooks and eyes, ha ha. So the center front has been reinforced with a facing on both sides. And then there are two darts on either side of the center front. They sit right about here. And they are boned on the front overlap panel, but not on the inside panel. On the inside panel, they're just sewn in. So, okay. <laughs> Got it. I, I, I get it now. Oh, I thought this I thought this was a different fabric here on the facing of this of this side here, but it's the same as the dress fabric. It's just discolored, probably because she sweat through it. But yeah, this is the same fabric as the outer fabric. You can see the color difference here. And that's probably all sweat discoloration because you can see it turning back to normal color. So I think she wore this a heck of a lot because it has sweat discolorations under the arms quite extensively. It has discolorations on the inside of the bodice. Oh, it does show a little bit of wear here at the bottom edge of the facings. But otherwise, this is in pretty great shape. Oh, this is interesting. So there are some stitches here where something was moved. Maybe it was the hooks and eyes, but I don't think so. I think it might have been buttons because the hooks and eyes are just sewn on with black thread. The buttons are actually sewn on with thread matching the fabric. So maybe they moved the buttons out at some point when she grew. I don't know. It's interesting because then it would have sat like this. And that makes no sense. Okay, so the only bit of hand stitching that we have, ah, get down. So the only bit of hand stitching that we have is along the bottom edge here where the hem has been turned up and there are very, 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 very tiny little stitches to keep the hem in place. And then they have these big green stitches that serve some function, I'm sure, but that I have no clue about. Oh, there's a bit more wear there where the bone is poking through. Now we, the hem is kind of worn out. The bones are poking through and I'm wondering, I'm wondering now if this has been made shorter. And then in the back we have three hooks and eyes that have been sewn down to the boning casings, which were probably to hold a skirt in place. Take a closer look at these buttonholes. These buttonholes definitely look machine stitched. They have been stretched out quite a bit. So another sign that she wore this to death. So looking at the back of these buttonholes, I might have to take back what I said about them being machine stitched. I don't think these might be hand stitched. If these are hand stitched, these are immaculate. These are just perfect. And I envy the person that made these buttonholes because she was she was amazing. Yeah. Okay, here, I can definitely see that these are hand stitched. Wow. You can see the little running stitch that you do on the outside of the buttonhole before you actually stitch in the buttonhole. So, wow. Wow. Props to you, lady. Props to you, ma'am. You, you were amazing. These are gorgeous. As opposed to these absolutely stunning buttonholes, the trim is tacked in really quick and kind of dirty. It, it's, 
there are these little tiny stitches but they're like all different lengths and some of them are horizontal and some of them are vertical and they're just kind of all over the place. I guess they just wanted to get this trim on there and it didn't matter how it looked on the opposite side. So that's, that's almost comically bad stitching, but that's, you know, you put on the trim at the end, you're tired of working on the thing. I get it. I've done that. I do that now. Just, just get it on there. And then let's see, here at the bottom of the front where these little fan pleats come together, there's a little bit of decorative hand stitching that is done with just a single thread. And it's a nice little detail. So the sleeve hems, the ends of the sleeve are finished off with this wide twill tape that is hand stitched down to the lining. And then the trim on the outside is sewn down with a triple row of stitches for some reason here, but not on the bodice. Still really ugly, crazy looking stitches. But here it's much more tacked down where on the bodice we only have one line of stitches to hold it in place. Then the elbow of the sleeve, is that what seam? What's happening? What is this? We are. Okay, that's a choice. So we have a seam here that divides it into upper and lower sleeve on the back side of the arm, but the front of the arm is one piece. So, and then at the elbow, we get some gathering stitches to, I guess, give you some room to actually bend your elbow. But that, why? Why is that seam there? What, what does, what, why? What purpose does that serve? I don't understand. Maybe to, uh, allow the top half of the sleeve to balloon out more, but then why wouldn't the bottom half just be one solid piece? I don't understand. I, I don't understand this design choice. Someone that knows more than me about sleeves, please comment and uh, let me know what the heck's going on with this because I got questions. Thanks for joining me on this little excursion to the 1890s and if you enjoyed what you watched today be sure to hit that like button below and if you want to see more frock talk, sewing adventures, and costume events eventually when the plague ends, please be sure to hit that subscribe button below and I will see you next time. Bye!